Today is four weeks since October 7th. Just four weeks ago, we were all going about our lives as usual. We were spending time visiting our friends and sitting in the sukkah. We were getting ready to dance with the Torah and then take a break from spending so much time in shul. But then, as if out of nowhere, everything changed. We cut our dancing short. We stopped singing our Sukkot Hallel, our psalms of praise, and we added in prayers of lament, prayers of mourning, prayers to protect our soldiers and redeem our captives. Some of us who had been starting to make plans to travel to Israel began to understand that those plans might be changed, that our trips might not run on their initially planned schedules. At the beginning of this war, I don't recall thinking and I don't recall hearing any ideas that this would be over quickly. That being said, with each passing day, it became more and more clear that things would get harder before they got easier, that we weren't done with this war yet, and that we might not be done with this war soon. Last week, I ran into a neighbor who I don't always see a neighbor who happens to be Christian and who happens to be religious. He shared his concern for the Jewish people in this time of terrible tragedy. And he asked me if this situation seems to be pushing Jews away from their Jewish community. It wasn't until I found myself answering his question that I just realized how much we were all showing up for each other and for ourselves in this terrible time. As we all remember, the first Shabbat after this happened, we were joined by Jews who hadn't connected to Jewish community in years. And the weeks that followed, we continued to be a welcoming and safe Jewish space, both for members who are here every Shabbat and for new friends who, before this war, didn't spend much time thinking about whether or not they had Jewish community in their lives. This gathering together marked a time of tragedy, and yet it also marked a time of unity. As we know, the tragedy is still unfolding. As we know, the Jewish people worldwide are under the threat of anti-Semitism, a disease of hate that we all know never went away, even as it seemed to some of us to go into hiding. As we know, the Israeli Defense Forces continue to defend our homeland, both on the ground and in their communications with the media. These hard-fought battles, of course, are still going on. As it feels like the entire world is trying to tell the IDF how it should defend the state of Israel, as it feels like the entire world is demanding that the Israeli army offer terms of peace to a terrorist militia working towards the utter destruction of our people, we find an important and timely teaching for us from this week's parasha. It comes right before the story of Sodom and Amorah, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the story of Abraham arguing with God. Like some of us, I have learned this story many times. This year, as I learn it anew, I think of one particular teacher of mine, a teacher who I studied with when I was living in Jerusalem. For him, this story of Abraham arguing with God is the prime example of how we must stand up to God when our world is falling apart. We must demand of reality. We must demand from our world only righteousness and nothing else. Our actions, the way we live our lives, must emanate righteousness at every turn. This was the perspective of my teacher. So let's look at the story in our parasha first through this lens this view that we must demand only righteousness. Our story begins when three mysterious visitors, having announced to Abraham and Sarah that they will have a son, take their leave of their hosts and walk towards Sodom. Seeing this, God pauses and reflects for a moment, then decides to tell Abraham about the concerning situation in the place where their guests are headed, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. God has heard an outcry from the cities. It seems they have been overtaken by wrongdoing. God tells Abraham of God's plan to go investigate personally, 
and to take whatever actions are necessary to manage the situation. In an act of great compassion, with empathy that might be hard to understand, Abraham comes forward to plead with God for God to reconsider. Our Eitz Chaim Torah commentary does not mince words when it notes, Abraham stands before God to plead for the lives of pagans who are depraved. While this commentary is technically correct, Abraham does advocate for, all, for the lives of all in Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham begins his argument with God by focusing on those who are innocent. Ha'af tispes tadik im rasha, will you sweep away the innocent along with the guilty? What if there should be 50 innocent within the city? Will you then wipe out the place and not forgive it for the sake of the innocent 50 who are in it? Far be it from you, says Abraham to God, far be it from you to do such a thing, to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty, so that innocent and guilty fare alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Hashofet kol ha'aretz lo ya'aseh mishpat? Our text is unclear on whether Abraham is unstoppably convincing or whether God is easily swayed. God answers Abraham saying, if I find within the city of Sodom 50 innocent ones, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. The next exchange between Abraham and God is described by my teacher as an act of holy chutzpah. Abraham begins to argue with God, bargaining down the number of innocent lives that would be required for God to save the cities. At every turn, God is receptive to Abraham's offer. Abraham demands increasingly small numbers of innocent ones required to save the cities, first 50, then 45, then 40, then 30, then 20, and finally 10. God agrees each time. After Abraham and God agree that if there are 10 innocent ones in Sodom and Gomorrah, God will save everyone in the cities, God and Abraham part ways. It seems like the negotiation is successful. It seems that Abraham has been effective in his demanding only righteousness of God and of the world. Yet, only one chapter later in our Torah, God destroys both of the cities, raining upon them fire and brimstone from heaven, go frit va'esh, me'et Adonai min hashemayim. God annihilates these two cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and all the vegetation of the ground. After Abraham's seemingly successful negotiation on behalf of these cities, they are leveled, they're wiped out completely. So what happened? Why did God do this? Didn't God listen to Abraham? Didn't God agree with Abraham's demand for righteousness? There are two, at least two, possibilities. First, perhaps God did listen to Abraham. Perhaps God did keep God's promise. Perhaps God wanted nothing more than to save these two wicked cities. It was only the lack of righteous people, not even 10, that led to the city's destruction. Or a second possibility, perhaps God did destroy 10 or more innocent ones along with the guilty. Perhaps God was just hearing Abraham out, not really intending to keep to the terms of their negotiation. Or perhaps God was initially intending to keep to their agreement, but ultimately didn't because God ultimately couldn't. Because even though there were 10 or more righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, God knew that to spare these cities would be to threaten the whole world. One of the reasons, perhaps the primary reason, that war is so devastating is that not all the righteous are spared. Innocent human lives are lost. It is devastating enough, especially we feel this today, it is devastating enough when our soldiers, who bravely and knowingly put themselves at risk, are lost in battle. It is all the more devastating when those who fall in war are the ones who are trying to stay out of harm's way. 
Given the severity of this devastation, what could possibly have made it worth it to God to destroy these two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, we learn from Pirkei's or Rabbi Eliezer that the sin of Sodom was not just that some people acted wickedly because people do that everywhere. The unique problem, the unique tragedy of Sodom and Gomorrah was that wickedness became public policy, endorsed and approved by the authorities. It is tragic and it is true that people everywhere act wickedly. Perhaps amazingly, that's something that we live with. That's something that we find a way to live with. But when wickedness becomes policy, we must remember that God saw this in Sodom and Gomorrah and decided to wipe out all the inhabitants of the cities and all the vegetation of the ground. For us as Jews, we know that anti-Semitism is the repulsive bridge between the wickedness of an individual and wickedness as a public policy. It is already a tragedy, it is already disgusting when one individual, one student, one professor singles out Jews and hates us for that reason and for no other reason. But when hatred for Jews becomes a pillar of one's charter, when hatred for Jews becomes a political talking point and spreads on social media, we must take action to stop this hatred, this anti-Semitism, from becoming public policy. We must speak up and speak out against anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on social media and on college campuses. We must contact our elected officials, urging them to stand against anti-Semitism, hate, and terrorism, urging them to stand in support of Israel. And we must continue to support our Jewish organizations locally and worldwide that tirelessly work to eradicate anti-Semitism from humanity. We must do this for our Jewish community worldwide, and we must especially do this for Israel, for our Jewish homeland. Last Shabbat was the Masorti Conservative Movement's Israel Solidarity Shabbat on which our congregation stood with congregations worldwide in support of our homeland and our holy land. The Shabbat before that was our, Adat Shalom's own Israel Solidarity Shabbat, in which we reached out to each other and to our community, opening our doors to Jews who needed a place to come and be seen, a place to come and belong. This week and moving forward, we must continue this season of solidarity. We read in the book of Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes, that there is a time for war and a time for peace. We stand together today proud to be Jewish. We stand together today against anti-Semitism and forever in solidarity with Israel. And we stand together today praying that our time for peace will come soon. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>